As you can see, this show is about branding, and this is the front cover of a brand new book, and the author is right here with us. The guy wearing glasses is Ken Loy, <laughs> PhD. Hello, Ken. Hey, good morning. Good morning, all. Right, and Sherry, uh, Sherry du Lac de Fougere. Oh, Fougere, very good. Yeah? <laughs> is, is that French or Spanish? It is It is French. It's uh, my husband's French. So my main name was Russell. So I got away from Russell to <laughs> du Lac de Fougere. <laughs> wow, it's a beautiful name. Wow. Thank you. So the lake of the what? Uh, the lake of the Fougere, which was the family. And then they uh -huh. used to own land. Um, and the, I think it's the do and the day are aristocratic. So they, they were landowners way, oh, way that, back when. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, Ed de Cohen <laughs> de nothing. <laughs> <laughs> on tv with you thank you very much and here's christian hello hi hi good morning welcome hi. hey welcome. christian yeah hi, we... Ken. hi ed hi sherry hi hi welcome and hi, thank you cool. this is amazing oh thank and you. i see the cover wow <laughs> first time for me thank you christian for um the introduction yeah um have you guys uh introduced each other already Yes. Yeah. We've, okay. We've been joking around for 10 minutes. You've been joking around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we are recording and this show is about branding <laughs> and branding. What does branding mean? Well, you have a personal brand. In other words, what do you think of me? Or oh, what's the image that I'm creating? All right. So you've got a yin and a yang thing here going. And then like the book cover, um, what does that mean to you, Sherry? The title. Yeah, performance appraisals and phrases. I think that's very interesting. Um, and especially to going out with the branding, it'd be kind of curious how it goes into whether it's, you know, the business brand or the personal brand. And, you know, if you're able to distinguish between the two. Yeah. Uh, to me, before we give the mic, to Dr. Ken Lloyd <laughs> um, to talk about this. Uh, personal brand means how people are viewing me, uh, not only in the role as a moderator, MC, but as a human. And a lot of people don't know me as a human, but a lot of people think they know me because of TV. <laughs> so that is a combination, Sherry, like we were just discussing, you know, this confusion or think it's, think it's the same thing, but it's really not. So if I were looking for a job and the, the hiring manager with whom I'm being in an interview, he doesn't know me from Adam and probably doesn't care. <laughs> uh, probably has some mixed opinion about my name or my my look or whatever, right? So how do I communicate, this is a question that I ask myself, how do I communicate who I am as a person, as a human, without sounding like a jerk or without sounding like a someone who likes to brag um, and egocentric, crazy. So, or I'm never going to be compared with someone who's shy, <laughs> but, but I do have a marketing brand and that is, I'm always asking for money. Okay. But, but why am I asking for money? Well, I need to get paid and pay bills. So, and so I'm selling ads or I'm selling subscriptions or I'm selling a connection referral. Uh, so that's my professional brand and how I'm doing it today in a variety of ways using uh, Zoom and uh, this megaphone has attracted a hell of a lot of lookers but not a lot of paying customers. <laughs> so you got to ask yourself, what am I doing this for? Well, I really like what I'm doing. So it's my personal brand liking my work and that comes through. And so I've decided to enlarge 
and augment the original brand by offering uh, my side hustle, which is media training or media exposure in an organized, systematic way. I call it the Gold Global Press Club. So that's like a product brand combined with my personal brand. Ken, now in the case of the book and all your experience as a business writer and consultant and a go-to resource, you know, considering all your uh, help articles, tell us about how you view the difference between your personal brand and your, we'll just say the book brand. Yeah, well, just personally, as long as you ask it that way, I think there's just a tremendous overlap. Uh, yeah, the brand, this is a book from Wiley Publishing. So it's not a, a, a self-published book. It's not inextricably intertwined with me. I, I did this. Uh, it's, it's a different different kind of brand. They they have their their dummies brand, which is a very well known brand, and I'm now affiliated with it. I wrote my first dummies book 15 years ago. Then this is the the new edition of of that book, but it's part of, if you will, my my business brand or professional brand from the standpoint of it's part of the kinds of services that as an independent consultant that that I offer. You know, working with individuals and companies on coaching, training, guidance, feedback, certainly performance appraisals, building the and, and organizations, if you will, internal people related strengths, that all professional brands, if you will, all interrelated. But since the consulting is really done by me, my, my own personal brand has to link in with it and basically align with that professional brand. And so I, I think just thinking from the personal standpoint, then it's all right. The personal brand hopefully would represent some degree of, of competence, expertise, experience, interest, profound and genuine interest in people, uh, helping them learn and grow and develop and to, to get that kind of message out. But I want to work with people. Uh, I don't want to have uh, the sensation of uh, coming in as some sort of know-it-all, but rather as a partner. And all, all as part of the brand to keep just an open two-way communication and a respectful working relationship, all under underlying whatever kind of, in quotes, expertise I can bring to an individual or to an organization. So there's an overlap for, for me on that. I would so say, Sherry, does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that does. And, you know, you having your years of experience, for me personally, I'm just finally realizing like, oh, there is such a thing as a personal brand and a professional brand. So I'm kind of a little late to the game, but now it's like, okay, well, I do have all this experience. I do have this and how do I portray it? How how do I show, you know, you can and and everybody, what I can do, what I believe. So that's kind of the fine line that I'm working on trying to figure out. So this is, like I said, an interesting topic. And I think it's more relevant today than it has been. Sherry, let me ask you a question about your background, uh, working with Christian and and dealing with what? Relocatees, right? Transferees? Correct. Now, do you did you often deal with, uh, and this is all up, about the brand, okay? Um, did, did you often deal with the spouse or partner rather than the exact transferee? Oh, absolutely. So one of the strategies that I've learned early is when you're relocating one spouse, you need to get the other one involved as well. Hmm. Again, yeah, it's a, it's a synchronicity. So I think that was one of the first mistakes when I started in this business it was looking at the paper, okay, this person gets these benefits, I'm talking to them. But growing, learning, it's like, well, no, if you are going overseas, and especially my experience as well, you need to have everyone involved. Because if the spouse is not happy, it's not going to work. Would you call that a psychological contract between the employer and the employee and family? A psychological contract, if you will. Yeah. A I, duty to perform, a duty to care. Yeah, I think it is a duty duty to care and to get everyone on the same page. 
Um, and that's kind of the the balance you have. And especially too, which is can be difficult, is if the moving employee doesn't have all the benefits, but they're in need of it. You know, it's it's you as the consultant going back to the company saying, hey, they may need more time in temp living. But if the company says no, this is what they're going to get. So sometimes it is a fine line of the employee's benefit and working with the actual company. Let me ask you a question. How did you handle the dilemma of the dual career situation when the spouse or partner is getting screwed essentially by not having an income, not having an identity and have it and, you know, it's a square peg in a round hole kind of. Yeah. Thing. It, it, it's tough. I mean, and you really, and you kind of have to play therapist and kind of see exactly where their mindset is. Um, there was, you know, couples where, you know, the wife would be like, okay, well, we're going to have to move, but she was okay with it. You know, she would, you, we'd find her, um, you know, expats in the same area to feel that connection. And then there was some where, you know, it was very resentful. So trying to figure out if they are wanting to move, if there's a sacrifice and how, how big that is. Because if it was where the wife or the husband says, I don't want nothing to do with this, more than likely they wouldn't move. Yeah, Christian? So it's um, the way I've looked at it is two things. First of all, there's not a whole lot you can do about the spouse because your your job as a relocation consultant is to make that relocation happen. So Sherry said she played therapist, which you're often kind of dragged into that role because nobody else is listening. But you have to distance yourself as much as possible because it interferes with what you're trying to do. Um, but the second part is you have to get at least a vague idea of where that couple is at in terms of the dual career situation. Because uh, I've always trained my team, Sherry knows this, to really look at what are you working with? I always compare it to cooking. What kind of ingredients do you already have? What do you need to get? And what can you substitute or leave out? And if you feel from the first call onwards but that there's resentment, that there's... Um, that they're not the, the two spouses or partners are not on the same wavelength. An alert goes off because you know that you just had, you just found out you have another challenge to overcome in addition to all the other challenges you have anyway. So you have to think about what are you going to do about that? Well, one of the ways you deal with it is that you set very clear boundaries. Um, we talked about this in our team meetings all the time is how do you make sure you don't get sucked into the, and I'm, I'm being a little pejorative here, drama of what that couple or that family is going through, because ultimately that's not really your concern. You have to work with it and work within the framework and the confines of it. But ultimately it's not your life. It's their life. So let's bring this into the brand, personal brand, business brand and how that relates it's a little foggy of course that's why we're talking about it to try to shed light on it and see where the confusion is and where the difficulties are in organizing this i do quick aside on december 12 12 12 uh, is our new york meeting at hsbc and philip berry who's the the uh, the wisdom, <laughs> the fun. You wrote wisdom. the book. You literally wrote the book. And it's still doing it all these yeah. years later. And he's going to be our keynoter at 10 a.m. New York time. And that'll be on video, on live TV. Uh, so I invite you all to uh, join us. Those, you know, you, you know, Sherry, please be my guest, which means free. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody else is paying, but not you. <laughs> no. So, um, so this is going to be a live recording, uh, and eventually it'll be in video format uh, across the network after some editing. Um, and he's going to he's got slides uh, to differentiate between personal and professional. Um, 
So more about that. I wanted to bring, uh, ask those questions of you because a lot of our audience works in mobility or is impacted on HR issues one way or another. Yet the issue, particularly now with the growth of uh, video, uh, not just as a play tool, but as a learning tool and a business tool, if you use it right, it's effective, very effective. I've proven it. Uh, Ken, um, the the title of the book is a continuation of what you did a long time ago and the branding, if you will, the branding with Wiley, the publisher. It's a long-winded title. And you found that necessary to do, right? Because of the nature of your customer, the customer meaning the corporate reader. Yeah, it, the, the brand obviously is Wiley. And uh, the book really talks about performance appraisals. Okay, so there's the first part of it. And phrases. Uh, the folks at Wiley rightly suggested in the first book that a lot of managers are interested in getting some wording on how to basically make comments, written comments specifically, about their employees' performance, all the way from exceptional to, to needs improvement. And uh, they had said, would I, would I write some of those in this book? And now 3,300 plus phrases later, uh, <laughs> the, answer, the answer is yes. But uh, yeah, so that, that lengthened uh, the, kind of the overall concept of the book. Uh, but they put the, the phrases, uh, the notation on that in the bullet points on the front and the other. So yeah, this is, you'll even see that we didn't even write the word and, you see an ampersand there. So <laughs> at least we saved three letters. But yeah, you don't want a super long title. At the same time, uh, you want to tell, here, here's what, if you will, this product is. And it does say newest edition. And the reason is that in 15 years, performance appraisals have changed dramatically from the once a year dreaded event to continuous feedback, multiple evaluation sessions, far more focus. Uh, I'll use the expression Christian likes, far more forward focus. And, I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, feed forward and uh, coaching, development, career planning, working with people. So it's not just saying, hey, you didn't do a good job on this thing that I, we worked on six months ago, but rather, regular communication, two-way communication between employers, between managers and their team, individual members of the team, and working with them to help them learn and grow and develop. It's a very different kind of approach. So that's really where the impetus was uh, for doing the, the new edition. And in terms of you know, for professional branding, I like having as part of my professional brand that uh, as an author and, and an author of, of a dummies book, affiliated part, you know, part of that Wiley team. I, I think it's, they've been a wonderful group to work with. And I think it helps when I want to work with companies, for example, in the area of perform, performance appraisals, that I'm not coming in just with some wild views about it, but there was a lot of research, a lot of time, and a lot of looking back at experiences with various companies, and individuals, and organizations that went behind the book. So that, you know, your professional brand helps open open doors in that sense as well. And so there, there is that link between personal brand as an individual who's hopefully skilled and professional in this area and professional brand, uh, here's, here's how it really applies in the area of work. So let's talk about personal brand, uh, following up on what you just said. The personal brand with this kind of a book and the purpose at hand is a little nebulous for me to understand, okay? Uh, but I understand it's for business purposes and it's for an HR manager or a line manager to pick up a tip and, you know, breeze through it. I'm going to have an interview tomorrow I need, or in 10 minutes and I need to look and get my head around something. And so, from that point of view, it's got a, an index, a uh, table of contents, and then a, an index under key words or key phrases. And people could go down the index and find that page, page numbers, where that is mentioned. Is that the kind of workbook that this is? Uh, not really. Yes, that's all there. 
But if the manager is thinking, I got to do a review tomorrow in 10 minutes, that's not anything to do with the, with the book. The book really shows managers how to have regular, continuous feedback, meeting regularly with employees, uh, working with them, maintaining open communications. Uh, we have formal reviews multiple times, two or four times a year, but there's, there's no big gap between the evals. Uh, yeah, well, we could have the formal appraisal and here's what it is and we do that, but it's now in the context of ongoing communication, ongoing feedback back and feed forward going back and forth. So that, yeah, we'll put, we'll have this now formal session, but it's not that, oh my God, I got to do it tomorrow. I haven't given have this person any, any information. Now I'm stuck. What am I going to say? Uh, it's really not the best way. The best way is to, again, maintain that open communication. And then if you need help, when that formal appraisal arises, the book, the book has tools for you in that regard. But there's just also a lot of information on coaching and on helping employees with career development and career planning and dealing with areas in which skills and abilities need to be upgraded and getting employee involvement and employee motivation going in, in those areas. So it's, it's very, very much very different from I got to do this thing. Here it goes. I don't want to do it. The employee doesn't want to hear it. How am I going to give this? All that is, is, is gone. Because we now make this part of being a manager is that you engage in continuous feedback and feed forward with your employees. At the very least, meeting every couple of weeks. But certainly, uh, when they do something well, uh, make sure that uh, they get that recognition. And when an area needs improvement, we don't wait. And I got to look it up and say, all right, well, how do I tell an employee this person's failing? Now, that type of thing. That is gone. And if employees are struggling, uh, a much newer approach that's outlined in the book is through continuous feedback to work with employees to help them succeed, and carry their careers to the next step, next step, next level. Do you have a checklist of how a manager, a reader of this book, um, should practice empathy? First of all, know what it means, and then the psychology behind using the stuff in this book to have a better outcome. Yeah, uh, but yeah, there's no real heading that says, here's how I'm going to rate your empathy, highly empathetic, listens, cares, as opposed to focusing on behaviors that are related with empathy. Are you listening well? Are you communicating with people? Do you generally care about their, their performance, their growth and development, their needs, what they're seeking in the work? Are, are you a caring kind of manager? Are you aloof? Or, in other words, getting more at the behaviors as opposed to trying to assess a, basically a psychological trait. Let's look at the behaviors associated with it. And once we see is an employee or manager engaging in empathetic behaviors or is an employee doing likewise, then we can work, it, work with it as opposed to coming in and saying, you, know, you, you, you need to be more empathetic. Well. What does that mean? Let's look at it behaviorally. And that's really where it focuses uh, on empathy and other kinds of uh, characteristics of effective individuals in the workplace. To what extent is this uh, dumbed down? Um, I, I hesitate to use that phrase, but uh, um, rather than highfalutin, uh, you know, how, how to get it done. Yeah, well, I, I, no, it's not really dumbed down, uh, although it's a dummy's book, it's, it's not <laughs> dumbed down. I, I would look at it more as, as readable. Uh, there's a lot of research behind what's in the various points that are made in the book prior to the section on the, where, where we have all the phrases. But it is research-based, but it's not an academic study. Here, you know, here are 14 studies going into detail, but maybe as a result of some of those studies, that really show that when people are receiving more consistent feedback uh, on a more frequent basis, it does affect their learning and their growth and their development and their performance. Uh, that'll be mentioned, but it's not gonna go into the study that was done at the University of California uh, nine years ago. It's not that kind of a research project. This is hands-on usable and taking the research that was done and putting it in readable and usable language and terms. So. It's not, if you, as you would call it, highfalutin, but it's not, it's not just uh, so basic that it's insulting. Uh, it's, it's really, hopefully, here's the newest information on how to be effective in providing feedback and feed forward to your team 
and help you learn, grow, develop, and perform and get to where they want to go. So the rel the relativity here uh, uh, to, uh, for example, our friend Christian was a senior manager, a leader of people and processes. Uh, his specific background expertise is linguistics, which means minutely using words that will have impact and and you know clear understanding, clear direction. Sherry, with you as one of the students, if you will, <laughs> uh, the doers. Uh, within that structure. Would you have wanted this book well, when you were starting out? Starting out, well, it's interesting because all of these constant feedbacks, it started very early when Christian uh, became my manager. Um, I was very hesitant going from my associate role to a consultant. Um, but Again, Christian talking with me, um, saying, hey, you know what? Let's have a weekly call. Whether it's just 30 minutes, let's see, where where are you struggling? Where are you finding you're, you're doing well? You know, what what issues can you see? Because my, my problem in the very beginning was I don't know what to expect because I was so new. So... Again, with the cases with uh, mobility, you know, you've had, you know, your your pre-travel, you have your household goods, your temp living, and, you know, they're so intertwined that I couldn't see problems before they arise. So with Christian and these calls, I would say, okay, here I have this VIP, this is what it looks like, and then he would be on the outside saying, okay, well, did you check about this? Or what about this? This may come up. So that really became really a, a benchmark of of my of my growth. And I think it was nice. And again, with Christian, when we started, it was in person. So I developed that trust. And, you know, the uh, one on ones were always in person. And then after COVID, it was remote. So I don't think it would have been as effective as if I didn't build that trust if it was just purely remote. And I think there's a, a difference there as well. Hmm. This is great. great. Great conversation. I think that shows the combo of Christian's professional brand and his personal brand. And professionally, uh, uh, Sherry certainly pointing to the expertise and the professional guidance that he provided. And yet personal brand... There is an outreaching, warm, caring, empathetic, intelligent, experienced individual, all part of who he is slash his personal brand. So he's combining the two in, in dealing with, with his team, and specifically in this case, dealing with Sherry. If and the light look, was look better, you'd see that I'm generate. blushing. <laughs> Sorry? If the light was better, you'd see that I'm blushing right now. Thank you so much for the compliments. <laughs> Didn't want to interrupt you, though. Keep going. I like hearing that. <laughs> I don't see any you know color I mean change. That? He brings a <laughs> sense of humor. That's part of his personal brand. You know, all all part of it. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, this is unrehearsed, in case you didn't know. <laughs> we just, how are we going to talk about this? <laughs> in terms of the brand, um, one thing that, that Sherry and I have talked about you know, recently uh, that we're both working on is to define our, our brand because, as Sherry said, this is something that is now much more important uh, in a particularly in a smaller community like the mobility community. Who are you and why are you different? In what way are you different from anybody else? So we're looking at figuring out what that difference is. In the case of Sherry, for instance, she does have that bicultural background. She has a spouse who was an SINE and who is now an American citizen. Like I was somebody who moved to the United States and then eventually became an American citizen. There's life experience there that other people don't necessarily have in mobility. And uh, the question now is how do you put all these experiences that make you unique into your brand. And 
you know, I've been experimenting with that over the last few months. I've, I've published uh, on the WRC website about this. And, you know, why am I not writing about tax compliance? Well, first of all, I don't know very much about it. And secondly, that's not my brand. My brand is I've lived this stuff and that's why I know how it works, right? So eventually I started figuring this out. And the other thing that's that we're kind of talking about almost implicitly right now is um, authenticity. And the book, while it gives you tools, it it assumes and expects that you're still authentic. You can't just, I'm sure it's not Ken's intention that the manager takes the book during the performance review and she just rattles off the first 453 uh, words. It, it has to be, this is a tool you prepare and then you use it, right? So it has to be authentic and brands today in general have to be authentic. And the way to really convey that is for instance, on this show, as you just said it, it's unrehearsed. None of us had sat down and said, okay, here are my talking points. I'm gonna rattle them off. We just talk, right? And similarly on LinkedIn, uh, a lot of people have figured out that you should write about what what your brand is, what you're interested in, not just deliver a canned slogan or a canned message. Um, and this is what, what Jerry and I are now working on and experiencing and, and figuring out the best way for ourselves. So one of the things I'm going to be doing at my 1030 today um, is launching a new show. This is not a pitch. This is just an explanation of trying something new from off the cuff, if you will. Mm -hmm. But but not really, because it's uh, an extension of what I'm already doing and what uh, James is already doing. I don't think you guys have met my friend James Moss. He's no, a, he's a real estate England in England, right? And New York City now. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, becoming an American citizen. Um, but, or he already is. I'm not sure I got that right. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk about it. But he has great expertise in London real estate uh, for many years, uh, quite successfully. And then he uh, moved to New York to expand uh, and start a family. So, a second family, I might add. But um, so it's going to be about uh, real estate uh, from London and New York, how it's similar and how it's different. What makes it similar, and this is where the brand thing comes in, because there's a lot of realtors <laughs> out there. So how can you, he differentiate himself? Mm -hmm. And so... He has been a uh, member of the Global Press Club since the day I started, thankfully. And uh, he recognized that he had a difficulty in front of the camera and he needed to understand what to do. And so he's been a guest on several talk shows, mostly one-on-ones rather than in a group setting. Mm -hmm. So I've been after him to consider and then he relented, but I've been planting seeds <laughs> that he needs to just show up more <laughs> and just get more involved. Yeah. And don't worry about uh, having a script because they don't right. come on my shows, but talking points do. Keywords, key phrases, rather than memorization, because of what you just said, authenticity. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to come across, like I'm trying to do here, uh, but I have some acting training, so I'm able to coordinate my hands with my mouth. <laughs> and sometimes that doesn't work, but most of the time. So I'm basically uh, auditioning <laughs> um, just day in, day out um, to get people to want to learn from me and what to do to help their own businesses. And by them doing that, I'll benefit. So we're, our first show uh, is under that brand is going to be at 1030 today. And I don't know whether it will be a weekly or every two weeks or 
once a month or we, it may wind up in the ash can right away. <laughs> Not sure, but we're going to try it. People have to do the same thing when they're learning a new position or whether they're thrown into a new situation like unemployed and then dealing with strangers and they're going to ask you a question like, why do you want this job? You know, and I'm, I don't know. I need money. But, you know, you can't answer, <laughs> answer. it that way. You <laughs> can't, can't say that. And, and yet you can't sound like you're bullshitting either. Right. So how do you do that? May I ask you? Because it's your brand, your personal brand. In the way you answer that, that's going to reflect to that hiring manager, your personal brand. So it's like walking in a minefield. You're being set up to fail. So how do you avoid failing? Who are you asking? You. Oh, me? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. My my linguistic skills are, are not there yet, but I'm learning from you. I, I'm sure we all have answers for that. Well, uh, my own my own take on that would be to um, first of all, yes, what I, what I just said about the brand. So I have a pretty good idea about what my brand is right now. Right, that may change or over time, but right now I kind of know what I stand for. And the second half of that would be the the job description, and it would be. Um, and I learned a lot from Heather, the Cruz Conair on this. She coached me on this, which is very sweet of her to do that. Um, you, What you want to do is you want to compare your brand and what you can offer, your brand statements, to what's in the job description. And then you want to explain how much of this overlaps uh, as much as possible so that it becomes about what can I do for you, the employer, rather than what can you do for me? Uh, that is crucial. And when you said set up to fail, yeah, that's definitely something where people fail or where people kind of fall into the trap to make it all about them. So you have to walk a very fine line. Minefield is, I think, is a little negative, but you do have to walk a very fine line between representing your brand, talking about yourself, being confident, but at the same time, never forget that it's really about the employer. It's about what they need what they are looking for, what the job description entails. And uh, what I do with regards to the job description is I apply my own principles that I just talked about to really figure out are there any, uh, any phrases in there that aren't clear or even make no sense. Or um, I apply to, to one job with a company that offers both insurance and, and consultation uh, or uh, consultancy services and they said that I would have to sell insurance and it was because somebody copied and pasted it from the from another job description it was totally wrong so I pointed it out probably cost me the job but at least I knew what I was working with and I didn't have to sell insurance you know it's really un understanding what the job is all about and then explaining how you would meet that that's my answer but I'm still you know, working through this. Sherry? Um, I think right now it is a employer um, specific. So what that means is they are looking for skills and years of benefits. Um, I think in order to stand out, you need to be authentic. I think a lot of people who... I mean, they use chat GPT, for example, mm. to um, see what questions are the hiring manager is going to say, ask me in an interview. So they'll read that step by step. No person. So that comes across very robotic. And I think right now, specifically, you have to have the qualifications more than what is requesting and to be authentic, to be able to stand out, to get to that round two or round three of the interviews. Ken? Okay. Just going further on uh, the points that Sherry and Christian brought up, you do want to be in a job interview prior to well-prepared to try to learn as much as you can about the company, the industry, the competition, and certainly the position itself. But to, to go in there and into a job interview and 
sense, okay, what, what are the kinds of questions that can be asked? And I don't know that you run out to, to chat GPT, but if that'll help, any resources that you can use so that you come in prepared, because frankly, you're going to a sales meeting. The product you're selling is yourself. And you don't want to oversell. You don't want to come across as the, the stereotypical backslapping salesperson, which are, it's not the most effective way to sell at all. You really want to come in more focused on listening, paying attention, being clear, not over talking. Yeah. Uh, there, is even, there are even some studies that show that interviewers like candidates more in direct proportion to the amount of time the interviewer is talking. So you don't want to come in there and talk and talk and talk. And talk. They ask you one question. Well, yeah, they start out with some ridiculous generic question. Tell me about yourself. And you go on for 14 minutes. That's that's not going to work. They, they do want to see that you're you're sensitive to them and to the situation. And you should have. They may ask at the end, what are some questions that you have? I, I've asked you several. What comes to your mind? You don't want to sit there and say, well, you know, I don't have any questions. Have some good, intelligent questions, but not about... Uh, how much are you going to pay me? How do you guys work the bonus plan here? But really focus on on the work and the contributions and totally agreeing with what uh, Sherry and Christian are saying. Uh, what what are the benefits that you bring to this position? And make sure you understand how can you do the job? In other words, what are the, the traits and characteristics that you possess? Your energy, your drive, your motivation, your focus, your work ethic, all of those factors. And will you do the job? Will you do the job? Uh, looking at, the, frankly, the technical training. Do you have the knowledge, the skills, the ability, the the background, the expertise? So they understand that this is a person who not only has the key factors off of a checklist that can do the job, this much experience, understands this program, knows about this technology or whatever it is that's critical to the job, but also is quite professional, work oriented sociable, gets along with people, a good listener. Uh, you want both sides of it. Can you do the job? And I might have reversed it. Can you do the job? Do you have the skills, knowledge, and abilities? And will you do the job? Do you have the, the drive, the interpersonal skills, and any other, if you will, soft skills that are critical to the job? And all this doing the exact opposite of what I'm doing now. Don't over-talk. Don't oversell. <laughs> and, and pay attention to the person you're talking to. People tend to like people who are kind of similar to themselves. So if the person is talking slowly and being very deliberative, if you come in and start talking like this, let me tell you about myself, that can undercut trust. So try to, if you will, pace yourself, pace yourself with that individual, listen and truly pay attention as you go, as you go through the process. Let me ask you a question about interviewing and if you don't want to answer this, that'll, that'll be telltale. <laughs> but let's just say that when I was not self-employed and I became self-employed because I was sick and tired of being fired or made redundant, okay? So if somebody <laughs> asks you uh, or asked me, I'm not going to put it on you, but let's say somebody asked me because I was looking for a job because I need money and I want to try something. So... I applied and somebody and, and the, the boss or whoever was interviewing me says, you used to be involved in selling municipal bonds and you wore a blue suit and white shirt and dark tie and shine shoes. And why did you leave that? Uh, I quit because I couldn't stand the job. <laughs> and I think I just, those are the exact words I used. And... <laughs> that's authentic definitely <laughs> give you that 10 points for authenticity <laughs> so what why were you fired is a real question <laughs> and now that's a loaded gun right but why are they even bothering asking that question they, they're testing me out right to see how I, I would deal with that am i refusing to answer or am i giving them some bs or something authentic which will just mark down the check mark and move on so I, I don't know what I'm saying here anymore, but the, the whole idea of personal branding is how one presents themselves mm -hmm. to the situation at that moment, because it might be different at another occasion. 
Yeah, but it's a, it's a fair question for a, a potential employer to ask. It's job related, it's work related. It, you'd ask that question of all of the candidates. Typically, is what did you, you know? What was your job? What did you like? What did you dislike? And and why did you leave? And uh, it, the idea would be, and again, the word authenticity comes back. Look, I, I left that job and said, you know, I hated it. I couldn't stand it. And, I really was looking for what were you actually looking for when when you left, whether it was voluntary or involuntary. I wanted more independence. I wanted more challenge. I wanted more two-way communication. The job had changed very much from, from when I joined. But to, to be honest and open and candid about that, because that's part of that's part of what you want to demonstrate, that you are an authentic individual, but you're an honest individual. And you're not just coming up with uh, the same old, same old answers. That, well, I really wanted more challenge. All right, well, let's really get into that. Tell me about the aspects of the job that were most challenging and least challenging. And so you want to be thinking about those kinds of questions going ahead. Unfortunately, today, employers, for the most part, are not using questions that are designed to put you under stress. There used to be something called a stress interview. And that's out the window because they're not job related. And they fortunately, for the most part, understand the importance of keeping job interviews work related and not getting into personal, private factors and matters that have nothing to do with the job and frankly are none of the employer's business mm -hmm. and can actually set the stage for trouble if, if they start going down that road. So fortunately, a lot of the interviews these days are more more structured, more appropriate, frankly, more effective than, than what they used to be. Looks like Kristen had a... Well, I, I was going to um, take what you just said, Ken, and apply it to the, the idea of the brand. And with that answer, Ed's question from my angle. And this is something that I learned, you know, a few months ago, but the way you would, you would do this, Ed, you would prepare for that question would be to tie it to your brand. Uh, so if you quit, you know, you weren't made redundant because as you can just say you were made redundant, you know, for financial reasons. And that's kind of the end of it. Your, it, it was outside of your control. But if you quit, what you would then have to do is the explanation you're going to give has to do with your brand. So first of all, you, once you figure out what your brand is, um, then you tie this to why you left because it no longer corresponds with your brand. And then you have to tell the interviewer why your brand and what they're trying to, to offer you in terms of, you know, this is this is what the job would be, why there is a great match between the two. So it's almost like a three-step process. But if you think this through with your job description and the idea you have about your brand, you can kind of turn this around, right, and make it very effective. I wasn't happy in my job, yeah, but you're saying this a different way. In a way, it didn't align with my brand anymore, whereas the job that we're now talking about would very much align with my brand. That's how I would answer this today. But I want to hear what Cher has to say too. Um, I think I think that's an interesting point. Um, I really believe it has to do with the type of recruiter or the hiring manager. Mm. Um. I think if you have one that's open-minded, that doesn't have a person already, you know, they want to hire or move forward with, I think that's very effective. I think it's being very authentic and again, putting a spin on, you know, if you just decide to leave, you know, I, oh, I quit. Well, I did it because, and, you know, going into your personal brand, kind of respinning it. But that has to assume that the hiring manager or the recruiter is really being authentic and wanting to learn about you and your skills. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of what I'm seeing in the market now. Um, a lot of it is there are job openings, but there are people that they already have slotted in. So they are doing these interviews and process just you know, to, to check the box. So I think that's a fine line as well and a different aspect to this. Because if, again, with the company that wants to be open and see all the candidates, then I think it's great. But I think with most, and especially now with, 
the economy and the jobs being so low, I think they've already had people in mind, which is kind of difficult uh, to overcome. Jim? I totally agree. That is so distressing for job candidates. And the company is going through the ritual of interviewing, taking people's time, and frankly, wasting company time just so they can go back to the person that they want to hire anyhow. And it's, it's, it's just, it's not fair to, to anyone it's, at all. And when companies are doing that, you know, if, if I saw that going on, I'd really just look, if we're going to interview people and bring them in, they all have to have an equal shot at this. And frankly, if there, if you have someone that you want to hire and this is a great candidate, why are we going out? Well, we just want to demonstrate that we're reaching out into the community. Into the community. Well, you're, all you're doing is getting people annoyed, particularly qualified people that come in and present a very good case as to why they should be working here. Uh, it doesn't do much for, for goodwill. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I'm not wild about that approach. I know companies like to say, well, we reached out and we did this and did showed what, what good guys we are, but there's a there's kind of an unfair aspect to it. And people who are out there looking for jobs will go and interview not knowing, is this just gonna be a ritual? Are they actually looking for someone or they already have their candidate and they're just bringing me in to do this? And that's it's a bad way for a company to start an interview. And frankly, for a candidate to come in because maybe they are actually looking and you're coming in there with the expectation that they're not, and that can impact how you present, how you present yourself. Yeah, we have uh, about five minutes left, and um, I, I would like to just jump in and say thank you for, for doing this. I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop talking. But I'd like to ask ask Christian and, and you too, Ken, um, is hire, the hiring process in Switzerland different from U.S.? Well, um, I can only tell you what it was like when I lived in Switzerland and what I hear from, for instance, my brother who has a business and who is hiring people. Um, in Switzerland, you are expected to send a picture with your resume, um, which makes it much easier for the company to actively discriminate against you because of age. So, um, or, you know, sometimes probably even also looks. Um, if I don't like your mug, your resume just goes out the window. So it was very open discrimination with the pictures. Now, with LinkedIn, which of course, you know, 25 years ago didn't really exist. Um, this is a little bit different because you do have pictures, but the pictures may be old. So you don't really know what you're getting, but you're getting some version of the person that you're talking to. And you may have a video interview and then you have you know, what you see is what you get, right? Um, otherwise, it was it was a little more formal. Uh, and it was, we just talked about this the other day with our family, trying to tell Natalie that it was also customary to get an answer if you weren't, if you weren't chosen. Um, I remember how much of a shock it was when I moved to the United States and learned very quickly that the default is no answer. The default is you have no idea whether they even received your resume, what they were thinking about you, whether you're you're disqualified because they don't like your name. You have no idea, and there's good reasons why they won't show that you show you that, right? But um, not getting an answer was was kind of a shock. So I would say that that was definitely one of the differences. Okay. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of what we were just talking about here. I remember in hiring at the company that I used to work at when I was in that role as VP of Employee Planning and Development, uh, we would avoid what, what Sherry mentioned. In other words, let's go out and do a bunch of interviews. We already know who we're going to hire, which, by the way, uh, can also generate very questionable hiring practices. Mm -hmm. if we're going to do interviews. We'll make them real. And I remember in, in one, there was... A, we had several really good candidates and uh, made the decision, hired an individual. I remember telling another candidate, uh, look, you know, we did. We would get back to them afterwards, by the way, and not just disappear after mm -hmm. they wasted their time coming in to talk. Uh, and we would get back to them, let them know what's going on. And there was one, look, your, your background is excellent. We have, we're a growing company. We have a lot of opportunities. We will keep your resume here, keep it active. You know, when employers say that, oh yeah, you gotta keep our resume on file, which means goodbye. 
Uh, and then a month later, contacted the person and she was shocked. And we hired her. She had no idea because so many cases where employers go through these ritualistic interviews, they already know who they're going to hire. Or even if they don't, they hire someone and try to be nice. Hey, we'll get back to you. And they never do. But, you know, it's got to be honest and integrity, have integrity on both sides. We expect that from job candidates and candidates expect that from, from employers. You know, both sides need to be authentic or the whole process gets, gets really undermined. Sherry? Yeah, I agree. I think um, to build um, an employee base that really will work for the company and will give it their all, there needs to be, again, authenticity, where, you know, the whole um, recruiting process, the onboarding process, where they feel that they are valued, and then therefore they will work as hard. So I think once there's an understanding and a company really does those practices, then I think that's the best best case scenario. Branding, personal brand versus professional brand. They overlap for sure, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna continue this discussion, adding additional people and get their views and experiences and we'll have a, an ongoing study if you will conversation please come back thank you thanks Ed. thank you great seeing you sherry thanks Ken. Very pleasure Always. to meet you thank you so much thanks, thanks. all happy weekend and happy, happy thanksgiving weekend. thank yeah. you bye, -bye. Thank you so thank you bye-bye thank you, bye -bye. Thank you.